Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to remarkable people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. And my guest today is George the Poet. Uh, now, what he does is what it says on the tin. He is a poet, but he's also the maker of a multi-award winning podcast. He's made music. He actually started out uh, as a rapper and we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. But you became a poet you said, I think, before, because you wanted to change the world. Mm, I did. Um, and I felt like, as a rapper, my um, ability to communicate was frustrated by the tempo at which we were rapping. This was in the first wave of grime music. Grime is to 140 beats a minute. And that was a bit of an, uh, a restriction. And I was kind of forced to address that, 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 that restriction by a change in environment when I got to university. Very different space from the space I was used to rapping in. So from that purely practical consideration, I found a more conversational way of communicating my art and the ideas that it, it, that it championed. And do you think that makes it available to a, to a wider or more narrow group of people? That's a great question. I think it's a wider group of people because I think the elements of my rap that first uh, engaged the small audience that it had from the age of 15 to 19, the elements of, of that commentary are still carried over in my poetry. However, uh, you can have a more intergenerational conversation and just demograph uh, in, in terms of the people that you can reach outside of the quite parochial subject matter of grime music, you've got a lot more flexibility there. I mean, when you talk about the conversation and, and talking about things, I mean, is, is that the goal in itself? Or do you actually want to change things? Yeah, the latter. Um, but the I, 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 my theory of change is that if you can uh, get a better grasp on the conversation, then you will be able to build the case for change in the relevant spaces to the relevant stakeholders in a way that they can follow because they would have understood your logic from the conversation. So what, what was it about the world when you were setting out Mm. that you wanted to change? So immediately, I wanted to change the conditions of my community. I was just, I sensed as a lot of young people sense, as a lot of the young people that find themselves on the wrong side of the, side of the law, rightfully calculate, I sensed that there was a social economic stagnation in my community. So where did, where did you grow up? You grew up on an estate. I grew up on St. Raphael's estate in northwest London, next to Wembley. We could see Wembley Stadium from, ironically, from my bedroom. Um, but it is a geographically secluded settlement. It's a residential area. So if you don't live there, if you don't know people there, or you don't have social ties there, you will have no reason to pass through there. And as a result of that, opportunities for economic development passed us by. We were the last in the area to get broadband. I remember that because I was well into my secondary school life when everyone was making moves online with the advent of social media like MySpace. And I was struggling to keep up simply because I just was still working with dial-up connection and everyone else had broadband. So these little things and just also stuff in terms of just who is from the estate and, and, and what the estate is recognised for. Unfortunately, even though I'm from St. Raphael's and Raheem Sterling is from St. Raphael's and the founder of the biggest, arguably the biggest um, online talent platform in the country, Link Up TV, Rashid K K K Kassiria, is from St. Raph's. If you Google the estate, the top searches will be about crime. So you get a sense for these things as a young people, as a young person. And, and why were you there? Your parents were first generation immigrants. Yeah, my from parents. Uganda. Just arrived just before, not long before I was born. And that's the property they were allocated. Why, why were they here? Were they, were they, were they the Idi Amin generation? Nah, what, no, so they did grow up, grow up in Idi Amin's time, but they were actually running the, un, they were running from the unrest that was caused by the transition from the second uh, Obote to the current prime president, uh, Museveni, Yoweri Museveni. And so what did they do? What did they do when they For arrived living. here? Yeah. Whatever they could. First they cleaned, um, did whatever admin or, you know, we, we call it tieyo, which means work in, in terms of like manual. Un, un, low, but like, yeah, hard, hard working immigrants Definitely. came here to... Definitely, they just came here to work. Do their like, best. Like, like most the immigrants I know. 
and they got you to grammar school, to, to a famous yeah. grammar school. Yeah, they did. They did, and um, that, was, that was a hard-learned lesson from the challenges that my big brother experienced in a local comprehensive. Um, it was interesting. There were a few revelations that my parents stumbled on in this journey. So first of all, they just they they innocently sent my brother to a local school, assuming that there would be a, a you know a continuation of the values that they inculcated within us. Just do well. What's the, how hard can it be? Focus and don't get into trouble. But what they saw was um, very low expectations from the broader educational establishment and the school in particular, in terms of what classed as is as high performance or acceptable performance. So my, my brother's early secondary career was rocked by these low expectations and just the challenges of being in a local school with young people that were bringing challenges from the community, uh, again, of a social, in, uh, social and economic nature into the classroom. Now, when my parents got it in their head that they wanted to try a different approach for my educational career, they quickly realized that I couldn't even do long addition at, at 10 years old in year six. And my mom, I remember she was scandalized. I remember she was practically in tears. She, she, it had never occurred to her that the reports that we were getting back at uh, parents evening were overlooking this. So again, it's hard lessons about the expectations of what constitutes as acceptable performance. Um, and ultimately they put their minds to it, learned so about they, league they tables. they teach you themselves? Yeah, they taught yeah. me themselves. They didn't have money for a tutor. Um, so they, uh, they woke me up 6 a.m. every day, tutored me, learned about league tables, they didn't know anything about this. They had to just ask around and figure this stuff out. Why were you going, going along with it? You know, a lot of kids would go, no, I'm, I'm not getting up at six o'clock to um, do work. I had faith in my parents' leadership, first of all. Secondly, I, I was good at education. I always had a sense that this is a space in which I can attain status, in which I'm celebrated. Since I was three years old, I was encouraged and uh, applauded for my reading abilities and such. So it's very much a continuation of something that felt like a viable option to me. So what was it like going to Queen Elizabeth and Barnett and then coming back to your estate? It's interesting that we're talking about this today because I've been writing about this extensively over the past couple of weeks. Queen Elizabeth was a culture clash initially in the sense that I was around demographics that I was unused to um, and I was exposed to an ideology or I was being, you know, encouraged, nudged, prompted, forced into an ideology that I wasn't, I wasn't well versed in. Well, did it seem more middle class? Oh, it was, a, it was 100%, I mean, 100 million percent These grammar schools are all immigrant communities, yeah. certainly in London, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm so sure, I'm sure Queen Elizabeth is all Asian, is it? At the time, it was all Asian. Since then, it's become a lot more West African as well. Right. I, I, I assume West African means Nigeria. But it felt a higher status, did it? As yeah, it, it felt like um, definitely there were practices, values, and signals that we were given that indicated that in order to progress in society, you, the formula for social mobility that will work for you is to behave in this way, to communicate in this way, and to present yourself in this way. Did they te teach you to speak nicely? No, my mom taught me to speak nicely. My mom is the grammar police. So I think a lot of my um, uh, passion for language in poetry and rap comes directly from my mom being a natural linguist. So she speaks better English than most people I've ever met in this country. Um, and that is the kind of thing that put me in good stead and inherently advantaged me in the space of education. So, but, but then what, why you're in this situation, I presume you were doing well, mm. what, why do you want to be a rapper? Why not? When you're a kid. I mean, this is a great question and I'm glad you're asking. Ultimately, <laughs> we sense at a very early age that there is a lot about us that is overlooked by British society. We know that. We, as kids, we used to tune into Top of the Pops religiously, not because we were always impressed and amazed with Top of the Pops, but because we just, we just wanted to see someone who looked like us, and that was where we were most likely to see it. 
and this person would probably be coming with a form of representation, a swagger, a story that would align more with what we were experiencing in our community. And we started to get that. I got that when I was 10 years old in year five and so solid crew were able to go to number one with their breakout hit single, uh, 21 Seconds. I got that when I saw Lethal Bizzle, who's now, you know, a megastar in this country. I saw him doing Oi uh, as on top of the pops. I saw I saw these guys there in those spaces. Uh, I related a lot more to African-American forms of entertainment and social commentary at a young age, as young as eight years old. I remember finding rap music and finding some solace in it, and I couldn't articulate why. Now, I have a much better understanding of why that was the case. Why was it? Like I said, a lot about us was overlooked um, by the mainstream media. And I understand why. Media is by and large a, 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 a private enter enterprise. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a business. You need, Channel 4 needs an audience in order to make sense, to make business sense to the money people behind Channel 4. And as a result of that, uh, it will need to feed into and appease and engage conversations that resonate with their viewership. Now, if demographically their viewership is, I'm not saying this is the case with Channel 4 now or then, but if, for example, the viewership reflects the country, which is, let's say, 88% white, um, and only 4% of the country and the viewership is black, what does that do for a young person who's 100% black? Where does that leave you? You innately gravitate more towards forms of media and entertainment that speak to the other aspects of, you, of, of who you are. And I couldn't articulate this when I was younger, but I knew it. That's one aspect of it. But another aspect of the appeal of rap music is that it is universally captivating, almost universally captivating to a younger audience because it tells a story that again, you can't access in the media. So even if you're not directly relating to the story, which I suspect is a large part of my success as a poet, and then as a musician, and then as a podcaster, people sense that there's a story I'm telling that is not as accessible as we might perhaps like. And because of that, rap music drew me in and I was one, it was love at first sight, as it is with a lot of young people. But do you think rap music is trapped in the sort of um, a sort of a, a, a paradigm of, of of what it talks about at all? Unequivocally, that is the bane of my life. It was a, a, a big driving force in what I in, in in how I it informed how I approached the podcast. I knew that ultimately I want to get the rap community to a space where I'm sitting them down and I'm saying let's 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 move on. Let's evolve the conversation. However, I knew that I'm going to come up against the following criticism, uh, the following resistance. People are going to say, George, this is what the market wants. How are we supposed to transform what the market wants? So the podcast sounds like the way it does, largely because I wanted to demonstrate some proof of concept of how you can transform. You can take the same stories, the same trauma, and transform the way in which it, re it reaches the audience, number one. Number two, I knew that the audience would say to me, uh, aside from the fact that this is what the market wants, that ultimately, George, uh, I'm just talking about my life. And I wanted to show them how you can repackage your life story and make it a little more constructive. I feel like it's imperative that we make the maximum use of rap music as a means of education and journalism. When I say education, if you look at some of the things that I've been able to achieve on the podcast, the podcast my style of poetry is it comes from rap. Yet for some reason, I've been able to apply it to some really heavy uh, conversations in terms of geopolitics. I've been able to uh, advocate for the condition of my community from an academically informed perspective. I've been able to pull in references and just cross-pollinate a lot of what I've learned in rap with the, tra the training and the conditioning that I've experienced at that uh, level or that intensity of education, which I sustained for whatever, 10 years. So ultimately I wanted to show people that you can repackage your story and you can make yourself, you can provide further opportunity for yourself if you uh, evolve the narrative, but that's a really slow, mo slow moving campaign.
Because what, what you've also done in the podcast is explain to people that there is more to a piece of rap music or a piece of grime than you may think. That there is there is an emotion in there mm. or a trauma in there that you haven't spotted by just listening to it mm. um, over the radio. I mean, why have you done that? I mean, have you done that because you kind of needed you needed to explain it or that you needed the sort of the credibility of understanding it? Um, no, it's not the credibility of understanding it. So if we look at how my career has gone since the um, outset, I started off venting from 2010 to 2013. A lot of the poetry that I released was angry and it was inward looking and I was talking to my neighbours and I wasn't as conscious of how some of those conversations could have been taken out of context. What happened in 2013 was I graduated, so I came home. And when I came home, I updated my learnings on, the, on street life. A lot of the, the people, my friends that I'd left on the streets out of frustration, I'd, I'd, I'd gone to Cambridge and I was, I was bitter. I was embittered with some of the traumas that we saw in the community that went unaddressed. A lot of those friends had also grown in their respective life journeys, right? And they were able to say to me, George, I've been selling drugs all this time, but this is why. Look, it's a business. It happens everywhere. If it wasn't me, it would be someone else. I get uh, drugs from outside of our community and I push them in our community and now I'm trapped. And I wish there was a different way to do things. I wish I knew what I now know back then, but I didn't because I had no one to advocate for me. My parents, like your parents, George, had just got to this country. They didn't know what we were contending with. And this is the situation. So when my friends were able to give me that education on me returning from university, I updated the narrative somewhat. So by the time I was releasing music, you know, I, I got signed to Island Records five weeks after I graduated. So by the time I was releasing music, I was thinking a little more tactically about the order in which I would present my arguments and address things. The first thing that I worked on, the first thing that I delivered under Island Records was an EP all about problematic parenthood, premature parenthood, teen parenthood. And I wanted to establish that as the foundation of what I knew would be a long journey in reimagining and, and, and refashioning the conversation around what was happening in the inner city and therefore on the streets. A lot of people, would go to Cambridge or Oxford or wherever it is they, they, would, they would get to mm. from a background like yours and just try and escape mm. where they've been. Mm. You know, you could go off and get a great job, earning loads of money, go and work in the city or be a lawyer or, you know, whatever it is you, you, you wanted to have done, you, I'm sure you could have done. Mm. Why didn't you do that? That was plan A. And I wanted to do that firstly because I was out of ideas. I'd spent the age of 15 up to 19 <clears throat> trying to wrap my way uh, to a higher consciousness, right? And, and, and offer my peers to do the same. By the time I was 19, I'd been through so much in the hood that I was sick of the environment, first of all. And, rat and grime was, was on the decline for reasons related to the police and related to what I was explaining about the wider British experience, not necessarily understanding where we were coming from at the time. So I was losing faith in grime as it, as it is. And UK rap was, we, we, UK rap is distinct from grime. It was um, experiencing a resurgence and the tone of UK rap was a lot more, uh, was a lot darker. And because I was growing, I, was, I felt like I was growing out of the circular narrative, I felt dispossessed, felt displaced, I felt stateless. And that gave me, and then I went to Uganda for five months for my gap year. So that gave me the space to re remove myself emotionally from the community. And because I was so bitter, I didn't take that, uh, I didn't use that space to heal. I used it to kind of harden and say, w I'm going to Cambridge and you will never see me again because you guys are self-destructive. And you are the problem. I don't want to talk about the government and the police for the rest of my life. It's you lot that have the biggest opportunity to create change, but you will not. 
Now, I went to Cambridge to study sociology. You can't study sociology and stick to the idea that people are ultimately a, pro a product of their decisions. You're looking at structural inequality now, and you're having very high level conversations about it with world leaders in the subject. So whether or not I wanted to, I was softened. I, I, I reflected on the condition of the community and I was for the first time in my life physically distanced from it, right? So I had that perspective and it, it, it just changed my whole approach. So where, where do you think the balance is now for those people who, who you, you went back to, who were then telling you about their lives yeah. between personal responsibility and the condition in which they are mm. living? The balance is completely unfair because it is completely on them to change their situation. And I don't, I take no joy in saying that. I wish that wasn't the answer. I wish the answer was that if we can just lobby government on these particular issues and we can secure support in these particular areas, then within this time frame, we will, that's not gonna happen. And I'm gonna explain why that's not gonna happen in a second. So ultimately the, 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 the balance is on them, but ultimately nothing's gonna change in my generation, possibly not, not in my lifetime. And that was one of the most liberating realizations that I landed on um, over the past eight years. I'm fully conscious that, like, I, I don't know, I haven't said this in this interview so far, but eight days ago, the second uh, murder in 48 hours happened uh, minutes away from my parents' house, minutes away from my nephew's primary school. This happened to a young man who was uh, the victim of a case of mistaken identity. I guarantee you that before this month is done, there will be another young person who's perfectly healthy right now that will be dead in, in the ground with no answers for their parents. I guarantee that's gonna, if that doesn't happen, I'll come back on the show and I'll, I'll write my words down on a piece of paper and I'll eat them. But I know that's gonna happen. And as, as, as chilling as that is to hear, it's liberating for me because, because of two things. It reminds me that that next young person to die might be me, which gives me a sense of perspective. Secondly, it also reminds me that the conversation must continue beyond the scores of young people that will, 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 will fall in this cycle. The conversation absolutely must continue. So I am now liberated from expecting change in my lifetime. I don't, that pressure's not on me. And it helps me think, okay, when people do study me in schools, outside of schools, in decades to come, hopefully centuries to come, they're gonna be able to uh, trace my logic and think and kind of project it on the, the, the direction of my community because they're gonna have the benefit of hindsight, which is the future to me right now. So that helps me think in the way that I do. That's why the podcast came out the way that it did. But when, when you say nothing's gonna change, do you mean nothing, there are gonna be no external factors that change to improve all of those things? Or do you literally mean nothing's gonna change? Because if nothing's gonna change, why would anybody listen to you at all? Um, nothing's, remember I said nothing's gonna change in my lifetime or before the end of the month. So if we're having conversations about cracking down on knife crime, now we can start putting things in, into perspective. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean ensuring that incidences of violence involving young people and the, or the, the profile that we've become used to, desensitized to, does that mean that that decreases? And if that is what our aim is, then does that justify the 100 million pounds that has been committed to the police force in tackling this? And if so, to what extent does it justify it? But if we're talking about understanding knife crime, violent crime, gun crime, whatever's happening with these young people, would that 100 million pounds not be better invested in research? How much is understood about, understood about the nature of street level conflict? Because that's what this is. It's just conflict. These are family feuds, not necessarily uh, blood uh, familial ties, but in terms of groups of friends, who know each other and grew up together and 
because of the conditions of their community, because of the social economic stagnation that I'm talking about, are not uh, entering uh, mechanisms of conflict resolution, are not inheriting mechanisms of conflict resolution that will allow them to peacefully resolve their disputes. They're met with a culture of honor that has become entrenched, further entre entrenched with these generations of men before us who settled um, disputes in similar ways and went on to go to jail and die and come out of that space with messages that sound outdated because we grew up three to 15 years old watching you when you were 25 to 40 years old handling your conflicts in the way that they did, that you did. And now you want to talk to us about a better way. So we've inherited this situation. How much is understood by the government in terms of tackling that, in terms of building these mechanisms for conflict resolution? Nothing. Not, I have no doubt that nothing's gonna be understood by the government. And the reason I know that is because I would be laughed out of the room if I imagined for a second that I could present myself like this, with dressed as I am, with the do-rag and with the gold tooth, with the dialect that I'm, this isn't my real, my natural dialect, but if I talked in parliament and presented myself in parliament, the way I do to my neighbors, to my family, everyone would look at that and say, you're not gonna win. You're not gonna, you're not gonna break any ground. You're not gonna be able to uh, attain anything meaningful in that space. So as long as I can't feel comfortable in the places of real power that have a real opportunity to release the funding that might spark some new innovation in this space, as long as I can't feel comfortable in those spaces, nothing's gonna change. I know that. And so that means personal responsibility is where yeah. it comes down to and yeah. people changing their own lives. Yeah, yeah. So and can they? So they can. Um, people do this all the time. They just don't necessarily think of it like that. Now, this brings me to the rap community. There are, there, there are three battlefronts that I see. There's government, then there's the media, uh, and there's the rap community. So let me explain about the government and the media's role in the conditions of my community and the perpetuation of the um, negative um, outcomes that we see for our young people. Government, I have grown out of thinking of them as the, go as the government. They are the government, but to us, they are the white people government. And that's so liberating to realize. I'd, I'd, I wouldn't have dared say that out loud at one point or even think that privately to myself at one point, right? But, but it's very important that not only I bear this in mind, but the rest of my community really absorbs that understanding. What that means is we need to transform our expectations of what this government or any government that has to cater, that has to put on this one size fits all veneer. We have to understand what is realistic to expect of them. They govern a, a, a white country, right? And they have to, appease, not necessarily appease, but they have to speak to the concerns of the masses and the masses are white and they're outside of our community. Now it's not necessarily a function of their whiteness that they can't understand what we're going through. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it is the perfect descriptor of the divide. But do you mean therefore don't expect anything of them? Literally. Because to say they're the white people's government is really dangerous language, isn't it? Because I mean, yeah, it's dangerous language. You could then language, say, well, then they're white people's laws, white people's law rules. Yeah. They don't apply to us. No, it's not that they don't apply. They do apply. But they are white people's laws and white people's language. And for example, right, I uh, have advocated in parts of my podcast that uh, there should be, I, I've advocated for uh, specialist education for young, at-risk black learners, right? And what I am often met with in the media, which I now understand as the white middle class media, mass media, is the, the, the charge that, you know, white working class boys are uh, disadvantaged in education and they're underperforming. And what I find interesting is that this often comes from people who had no concern for white working class boys before a black working class young man started talking about what can be done for young black working class learners, right? Now, in that context, I am fighting off criticism and people are tweeting, if this is a live conversation, people are tweeting, people are saying, oh my God, how could George Poet say this? And reputational damage is incurred on my part in the short term, 
right? There is no reputational damage to the commentator who has brought that illegitimate argument to me. And there is no way of, ma of, of, uh, of, of motivating uh, the audience or the, or the public to be as enraged and indignant as members of my community will be at this attack on my blackness. Because that's, that, that's what's on trial here. It's the fact that I have the nerve. It's the fact that Stormzy has the nerve as a dark-skinned black man to create a scholarship that is for black students. You know, how ungrateful of this immigrant. So that's the narrative. Now, there are a lot of very well-intentioned white people that will look on at the, um, w that will observe the, the argument that is unfolding and say, and understand where I'm coming from and afford me understanding and sympathy and whatnot, right? But as was articulated on my podcast, what is at stake for the general public is not the same as what's at stake for me. After this interview, I'm gonna go back to my community in which I am at risk of losing my life for, for being part of a social group that is systemically disengaged, disen disenfranchised, disenfranchised and disadvantaged. I'm at risk of that. I know the nature of these conflicts. I carry this with me every single day. And there is no single institution or space in this country that will absolutely prioritize that, that will bloody mindedly prioritize that in the way that we are forced to prioritize, for example, Brexit. Suppose you did come to Brexit in a minute and mm. hold that thought. But um, suppose you did, suppose you suddenly get a Home Office Minister or an Education Secretary or whatever who says, OK, I get it. Mm. Um, and I will commission the research and I will look at the institutions. Mm. What do you actually think would make a difference? What would you say, what would you tell them to do? This is a hard question to ask because there's no way that can happen. Well, I mean, Diane Abbott could be Home Secretary. Right, but there's no way Diane Abbott, within the confines of the Labour Party, will be able to champion this, like I said, bloody-mindedly, in, in, in the way, think about how we, how we deal with Brexit. We do not know what's gonna happen. We have no clue the direction that this country will go in because of Brexit, but we are committed to figuring it out. That could never happen for the resolution on violent crime within this community. So we are discussing a hypothetical uh, situation. I have ideas around it, and ultimately my ideas all go to the point to the same conclusion. We're gonna have to, as a community, we're gonna have to handle this in-house. We're gonna have to commit ourselves to building up our, our articulation of the uh, trauma and the disarray that our young people find ourselves. First of all, we need to just be able to articulate that. We as yet can't. If I ask you about the, the nature of conflict, like with all of the resources available to, the, to Channel 4, you can't find that information as yet, right? So it wouldn't take, now Diane Abbott is beholden to the next election. She's beholden to the party line, right? So there's only so much that you can achieve under a system in which the political order needs to, needs by necessity, is incentivized institutionally to pander to the demands, the expectations, and the level of understanding of a public that is not sufficiently educated on our experience. Well, in fact, isn't it, isn't it likely to be worse than that? Because, as you say, if they are pandering, you, you would say, they would say meeting the demands of the majority of, course, of, of people. Course. Um, all those people are now concerned about violent crime yeah. because violent crime is reaching their communities. Yeah. I live in a very safe white community and violent crime is reaching us and mm. all my neighbors are really concerned about it. Mm. What do they want? They want police. Mm. Now, 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 policing um, is going to throw up, or more policing and more stop and search is going to throw up a whole new set of problems yeah. interacting with what you're talking about, isn't it? Right, that's right. And that would be a knee-jerk reaction to what the public can understand at the time, right? If the public understand that these kids need to be locked up, just like in response to the riots, if the public understand that these kids need to be off the streets, and if the narrative is pushed to the public that lock, uh, imposing or, or 
uh, allowing for longer, tougher sentences on carrying a knife will sufficiently disincentivize a whole generation from feeling how they feel. If that narrative is pushed to the public uninterrupted and is reinforced by the middle class white media, then the public do not have the opportunity to grow out of such childish thinking. It's not realistic. You think people in the hood are sitting around saying, listen, I know those guys want to get you, but you are aware that there's a tougher, <laughs> there's, there are tougher sentences available for carrying a knife. No one cares. You're forgotten about. You, you, you live in a part of the world that is not considered and is not understood and is not invested in. And ultimately, that's just the direction of, that's the nature of capitalism, right? But if we do not sufficiently incentivize uh, uh, a, a more intelligent conversation in-house that we are in control of, which again is, is, is something that I repeat throughout my podcast, telling your own story is the secret to survival. If we do not come up with a system that incentivizes that, then unfortunately, nothing's going to change. Can I just take you on a little dog leg for a moment because you mentioned your dialect and you said this is not your natural dialect. Mm. So what is your natural dialect? It's hard for me to um, slip into it now because of the social situation that I know that I'm in. So if I if I try and relax a little and I, and, I, and I talk like how I talk around my brothers, I wouldn't even say brothers, I'd probably say brothers. And now it makes me feel uncomfortable introducing that dialect into the situation because I'm being performative just for the sake of demonstrating it to you. When I know that if I tap into my Queen Elizabeth boy's brain, if I tap into my Cambridge experience, I'll be perfectly understood by you. Because, um, you know, young boys and girls yeah. are using that dialect mm. um, all the time, even if it's not really where they come from. Mm. And I find that mm. puzzling. Can, can, you, can yeah. you explain this? That's a, that's, a, that's a great point. So this goes over to what I'm saying about rappers, right? Ultimately, there are young people across the country and across the world who are enamored by the swagger of my environment, of my community. And by and large, it is broadcast to them through rap music and or rap culture. It's a little bit edgy, all right? It speaks to a truth. There are things embedded in our forms of expression that carry the defiance, the resilience, the strength that is kind of conditioned or innate within us. And young people might not be able to articulate that, but they know it. I observed it firsthand when I was in QE Boys. It's funny that we're talking about this. I just wrote about this on the weekend. I saw these middle-class kids convince themselves that they were gangsters in the most dramatic narrative of kind of rebelling against the staid pedestrian lifestyle of you know their communities or their families. And, and maybe, that's, is, is it, maybe that's part of teen angst the search for purpose, the, 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 the raging hormones that just need to be channeled. Maybe it's empathy. Maybe it's the fact that they haven't yet been conditioned as they will be when they enter the workforce or when they become accustomed to the narratives of the uh, middle-class white media or when they get used to the, um, the ebb and flow of the white people government. Maybe they're as yet unconditioned, so they empathize and they understand that something fascinating is going on there. But do you think it's a good thing that you've got generations of kids growing up wanting to talk in a way and, and talking themselves in to talking in a way that um, identifies with something that isn't really them for a start? Mm. So it sort of creates some sort of weird identity crisis. Mm. Um, but also sort of creates two different languages in their lives, mm. um, one of which is, you know, is is almost exclusive, uh, or is ex is as exclusive as the other mm. when it comes to getting on with the life outside. So what's going to happen is they will get on with the life outside. Life will kick in. They will have to pay the bills when they leave school and they don't have the luxury of playing with identity. And when they are in the workplace, they're going to have they're to make decisions. Conform. Right? They're going to have to. They're going to have to conform. But the advantage that will have been established in their enamored state with rap music and rap music culture 
is that by the time um, the next generation of George the Poets comes through and is and, and this generation is able to break beyond the circular narrative and is starting to push for the political transformation that George the Poet was speaking about in his time, they will be ready for it because they would have been acclimatizing to this thought process, to this logic, and they will have empathized for so long with where my community is coming from. As yet, the country is a long way away from this. Can you ever change then in your, in your mind this white people's government into a government for everybody? So you, you'll notice that I draw the distinction between the white people government, but the white middle class mass media. So the white people government has a much better chance, as, as has been demonstrated to me through Brexit, you have a better chance of at least embracing the communities within, the, within white Britain that have been left behind. You think that's what's happened with Brexit? Um, that's what's been exposed by Brexit, right? And, and I think Brexit has forced the conversation. It's forced me to grow out of the tribalism of leave means leave and uh, uh, remain re means remain. And if you're a leaver, you're this kind of person. If you're a remainer, you're that kind of person. Brexit has forced me out of that tribalist thinking. And Brexit has forced me to acknowledge that there are many different people in this country that feel exactly as we feel in the hood, that feel that like they do not have any relation to what is happening in parliamentary spaces. So what could happen within the way government works, as Brexit has demonstrated, is that the parliamentary process, parliamentary, par party politics can address itself to those aspects of the country. But those um, elements of British identity have certain advantages. First of all, there are a lot of older people in those spaces whether that is in constituencies that voted leave, people that feel like they have followed the EU narrative for um, the, the, the majority of their lives, and they've seen how the country has changed in, in ways that make them uncomfortable. Those people might not necessarily feel involvement in uh, uh, Whitehall at this time, but ultimately they are forcing their way into that space, right? That's great for them. However, we don't have that kind of benefit. We don't really know what this whole EU project has been about all of this time. We've been dealing with our own world in the hood all of this time. So in order for Parliament to catch up with what is going on in the inner city of communities like mine, you would just need more people from the inner city. Yeah, you don't have the numbers. We don't have the numbers, which is why I know that things ain't going to change in... In, in that sense. Well, the only, the only time it's made government sit up in the past is when there were riots. Right. And what did the government sit up and do? Lock everyone up. The deaths of 72 people in their homes through negligence and arrogance and opportunism wasn't enough for the government to afford a community the respect in Grenfell Tower. In Grenfell Tower. Right? Now, all of this, alongside other scandals that I'm not going to go into right now, alongside other traumas that have happened and unfolded in, in the public view, they tell us a lot about how this country really works. And we don't have the numbers to enact the change. Because, I mean, it's quite, it's quite radical what you're saying. Because, I mean, you know, mo most people, when, you, when talking about representative government say the only answer is for government and institutions and the media to reflect the, the communities they serve as best they can. Yeah. Get more black people on the telly, get more black people in parliament. Yeah. You know, and you're, you're basically saying that's never going to work. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. And I knew that for years, but I've tried my best not to say it. Why? Because I know that I'm at the mercy of the white middle class mass media and the white people government. And I know that if I fall afoul of these institutions, then it wouldn't be hard to make me look crazy. And I'm running that risk now, but I'm also conscious, like I said, that there's a, I might not make it to the end of the month. I'm from St. Raphael's estate. St. Raphael's estate has problems with the neighboring estate of Stonebridge. I shouldn't be talking about this. I'm, I'm risking my life by talking about this on Channel 4, right? But people know that I'm from St. Raph's. 
And people know that even though I'm George the poet and I advocate for the whole community and I just want peace, there are two problems with that. First of all, what comes after peace? Justice. So the perpetrators of, ju of justice who are less than 1% of the community, less than a fraction of a percent of the community, those perpetrators are incentivized to shut me up. And further to that, there are clever people in the ends as well that know that if something happens to George, chaos will break out on a scale that will um, potentially mask some of the bad things that they've done, right? Create a smoke screen. No, everyone's gonna forget where the anger came from or why they're fighting. It's just gonna be all out war. So I, I've got that on my head every single day, which is why I'm now gambling with my position as George the Poet, the multi-award winning podcaster, the guy that did the poem for the Royal Wedding, you know, the darling of UK poetry. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna gamble that because I might not even be here to, for August. Can we talk a little bit more about poetry again? Yeah. Because poetry in the traditional sense, um, you know, is not thriving. Uh, but poetry in your sense, or Kate Tempest, or rap music, or whatever it might be, mm. um, is such an integral part of modern British culture. Mm. So why, why, why are these two things co-happening? Co hey man, it's an extension of the conversation we've been having this whole time. Poetry for a long time has been the reserve of the intelligentsia, of the English predominantly establishment, and for that reason, it has had a certain texture. It's had a certain feel, right? But the poetry of my generation, of the Kate Tempest of the world, the Sophia Thakurs of the world, these people are on the front line. You know, they're speaking from a place of immediacy, of urgency, just like I am. Just like I was inspired to do when I first came across Kate Tempest's work, Sully Breaks' his work. These people were talking about here and now. And the, com and the conversation had an, uh, an, an unabashedly contemporary edge to it. So for that reason, there is renewed relevance in the space of poetry. How, how do you think poetry should be taught then? You know, should, should, should eight-year-olds still be taught Wordsworth and... I think there's, va I've, I've, I've experienced great value in studying the work of William Blake, Wordsworth, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Keats, Seamus Heaney, who's, who's, who's more recent, but from a different generation. Um, what The education that I received, that was GCSE English literature. And I, I was fortunate enough to be in a school in which I, I had no other choice but to concentrate and to understand and to grow, right? So that gave me the opportunity to realize the intention with which people approach poetry and, and how far that can stretch beyond generations. So there's, there's value in it. But I, I think ultimately poetry should be experienced. And if you're trying to prescribe it and teach it and control it and contain it, you're gonna fade into irrelevance. So more George the Poet in classrooms, I guess. More performance poetry, more poetry that is of consequence to these young people that acknowledges who they are and what they like. Don't tell them that the dialect that they're speaking isn't for them and therefore is going to lead to a breakdown in their identity. Just let them express themselves and call it poetry if that's how they feel. You did a poem about the go home vans. Yeah. Um, which, uh, you know, gave voice to your guttural um, or visceral instinct about what, what, what was going on yeah. with that. And you had a line in, I'm not sure exactly what the line was, but it was, it was to the effect of, if the government won't behave, why should the rest of us? Yeah. Um, how, how important do you think that, that thought is at the moment with the at way the, the government moment. is? Mm. It's hard for me to, to assess this because I'd have to understand the relationship between the things the government says and does and the broader British experience on the ground. But what I suppose what I mean is if that, if that white people's government, as you call it, is mm. held in contempt by white people yeah. right now, yeah. um, and it's held as irrelevant by your community, mm. um, is there a bigger danger actually about sort of disintegration? Maybe there's just a big opportunity. 
Maybe there's an opportunity for, because people are not stupid. When I say the white people government, I'm not saying that there's something defective within white people or you know, people outside of that circle. I'm just calling it like it is, right? I could also call it the, the um, Southern, Southeastern government, right? I could call it all of these titles that connote the, all the ways in which it is exclusive and, it, and inaccessible. But ultimately, in the spaces beyond that, you know, exclusivity, there's innovation. There are creative people, there are good natured people, there are good people trying to do good work day in and day out without any thanks or recognition or really without the remuneration that would make their time worth it. Now, perhaps there's another way to take control over the sentiment in our communities, the ways in which we're sharing information and enacting change on the ground that just completely renders the bojos of the world irrelevant. What, what do you think of him, seeing as you mention him? What do I think of Boris Johnson? He's a product of the institution that incentivized him to become what he is. Is he not? However you feel about that, I think we can all agree on that. We, we, we saw him fail to stand up for the ambassador to, to America over something that was completely out of the ambassador's control. Why? Because we are faced with Brexit and he's thinking long term, I need the Americans. I'm, I'm more willing to pander to Trump than to the people that would have me, you know, eat my words over Europe. You can understand why he would be in that position. It was, it's easy to be childish about and say, oh, he's a bad person. But this is the institution that he's that he's working with. I mean, today at the, our time of recording, mm. you know, uh, Trump has told these four American congresswomen to go home. To go home and fix their... Boris Johnson hasn't said anything about that. Mm. Theresa May is the one who said it's completely unacceptable. Yeah. That's Theresa May who sent go home vans around Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I have to get the laughs in where I can, right? And this is why I think it's really important for members of my community, especially, to really readjust your expectations of what this government of what this institution of government can do for you. It's not personal, it's not that they're bad people. It's not that whiteness equals racism equals badness, right? All it is, is that the situation is unworkable in terms of the things that are most important to you. You will never be priority. Um, I mean, we've been talking about it all, all along, but I mean, I ask everybody, you know, if, if you could change the world, what would be the ways in which you would change it? If I could change the world, I would establish closer alignment between the community of artists and policymakers. Why? Why would I do that? Because I think, you know, we just talked about the limitations of government as an institution. I think art as an institution is a beautiful place. It's fertile ground. It's the place in which social change can happen on a sustained uh, basis. An artist can be incentivized to uh, champion truth. Now, if their truth was informed by the clever, hardworking people in the space of policy formation and, uh, and, and, and academic literature and the people that are really you know, doing the heavy lifting in terms of understanding where we're at. If we can get some alignment with artists as advocates and mouthpieces and the institutions of uh, uh, change in this country, then yeah, man, we cut out the middleman. <laughs>